guys and welcome to this video on modeling linear growth and decay part of the further maths course really good to see you thank you so much for dropping by well there was a high energy introduction now my name is Darren otherwise known as maths guru and it is always good to see you if you haven't already done so and you would do me the great honor there is a little doohickey in the corner that will allow you to subscribe to my youtube channel and one guy sitting in a room on my own talking to myself and it's becoming a little bit weird your support shows me that you're actually watching these videos and then that i'll continue doing them just for you. Now, modeling linear growth and decay, what are we going to do by the end of this video? Well, I hear you ask. I want you to know how we can use a recurrence relationship to model linear growth and decay. Now, I hear the words growth and decay. None of them sound particularly good. Thank you very much, medical profession. Oh, I've just got tooth decay. Well, I don't, but I've just got bad images of, of manky teeth. Ooh. Anyway, uh, understand what simple interest is. Loans, investments, know what the word depreciation means along with flat rate depreciation and unit cost depreciation. This topic comes up in exams pretty much every single year and it's terminology that the work actually is not particularly difficult. But before I continue, we need to do a little bit of a recap. So in a previous video, if you haven't already watched it, please do. They're short and awesome. We looked at the idea of what a recurrence relationship was. It was a way of describing how to go from term to term to term to term in a sequence. And this was one example, V0 equals 10. Now, because Barry tried to trick us but didn't, we knew that this was effectively our start number. So if I had a sequence, I was going to start with 10. It says to get to my next term, I'm going to take my previous term or my current term and I'm going to add 3. So taking this, adding 3 gives me 13. Add 3 gives me 16, and then 19, and then 22, and 25, and so it goes on. So that recurrence relationship is just a way of describing a sequence. And notice these three dots here, ellipses, uh, which basically says to infinity and beyond. Now, as we can do in mathematics, many things we turn into graphs. Oh, joy. Now, you thought graphs were over and done with. Probably not. Sorry, note you've done all of that graph stuff before this. There's much more of it coming, and if you can get it sorted out, you're going to ace further mass, no problems whatsoever. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my previous recurrence relationship, which was v0 is equal to 10, v of n plus 1 is equal to v of n plus 3, and I'm going to turn that into what I'm going to call a table of results. So we knew that v0 was equal to 10. We knew that v1 would be 13, because we're going to take, remember, our current term, add 3 and give me my next term, then 16, 19, 22, 25, and 28. Whoa! Now while we know that we have these terms going 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, I'm actually going to ignore that for the moment because I'm actually going to look at the values of v0, v1, v2, v3. Because what I'm now going to say is, well, each of these little subscripts, these lower numbers and the big numbers actually stand for a set of coordinates. Whoa! Mind blown. So 0, 10, 1, 13, 2, 16, 3, 19. So what I'm going to do, he says, rubbing off some of the previous work I was working on, is I'm now going to plot the value of n, which is here, against the value of vn, which is here. Now, that's just language for, for Barry. So what I'm saying is when n is 0, I'm going to plot the value of 10. So 0 and 10. Here we had a value of 1, I'm going to plot that against 13, which is actually there. 2 is going to go against 16, and what I'm going to do is zoom in a bit to make it easier for you guys to see. 3 I knew was 19, 4 I knew was 22, 5 I knew was 25, 6 I knew was 28, and 7 I knew was 31. And lo and behold, ladies and gentlemen, what do you notice? I have a straight line. I could now absolutely, he says, trying very hard. Ooh, actually, I'm very impressed with that. Draw a straight line through those points. And I've noticed that I've got a linear relationship. What that means is I've got a straight line. So how would we describe that? Well, as I say here, notice the graph has an upwards trend. Now, you're going to get into trends if you haven't already done so, but it's got an upwards trend. We could say it's got a positive gradient or it's growing. We could also write a sentence to say that as the value of n increases, the value of v of n increases. All of those are equally valid, but we can see here that there is a linear relationship between them. 
As I say, what goes up can in fact come down, he says. What about this recancellation? Let's zoom back out a little bit so I can have a look at it. Tells me that my first term is in fact 25. Thank you very much. I go from my current term to my next term by subtracting 4. So 21, 17, 13, 9, 5 and 1. Thank you very much. Let's just check. Have I subtracted 4 from all of those correctly? 17, 13, 19, yep, 5 and 1. Brilliant! Remember, I'm not interested in the term here. I'm interested in this bottom number, my n value and my v of n value. So again, if I've got v0 being 25, then I have v1 is equal to 21 and v2 was equal to 17. And so these numbers here are now going to give me my coordinate. And so let's plot those. We've got 0 and 25. Thank you very much. We've got 1 and oh, 21. That's there. Thank you very much. We've got 2 and 17. Yep, we can put that one there. 3 and 13. Yes, we've got that. 4 and 9. Thank you very much. 5 and 5 and 6 and 1. So ladies and gentlemen, are they now linear? Well, let's zoom in. And let's see about drawing a nice straight line between them. I am fairly happy with that. Maybe that was a little bit too long there. Put an arrow on the end there to say that it's continuing to infinity and beyond. And an arrow there to say so as well. And what do we notice? Well, it's a linear relationship. And But this time it is decaying. Oh, isn't that awful? I hate that thing. Yes. So it's got a downwards trend. It's heading downwards. It has a negative gradient. As n is increasing, v of n is decreasing. All of these are important. But it is decaying. It is actually going down. Oh, horrible. Now, we've looked at formulas for linear growth and decay before. And we may not have known it, but that here is actually my formula or one example of a formula for linear growth. And the one I'm putting the red arrow around now is linear decay. What does growth mean? Growth means getting bigger and decay means getting smaller. And if we remember those graphs, this one here basically went up as in growing. And this one here was decaying. And the only difference, believe it or not, was that plus and that minus. Yes, I know one's got a three and one's got a four. Let's not split hairs. There's not a lot here. But we can make this more general. We can have a formula here that says our linear growth is defined by v of n, take my current term, add on some type of number, the same number, and that's going to give me my next term. And likewise, take my current term and take away a number, and that number has to be the same every time, give me my next term and hence linear decay. Now money, 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 money. Don't we all want to be rich? I would love to be rich. I'd love to get a thousand subscribers on my channel. God, that would make me so happy. Obviously, if you want to get rich, here is my top tip to getting rich. Uh, work hard, get an amazing job, earn lots of money, then you'll be rich. Uh, yep. Now, basically, what happens when you earn money? Hopefully you're going to give it to the bank. And when you give the bank your money, they'll pay you interest. Now, if you're really, really lucky, they'll pay you interest on the right account and they'll pay you lots of interest, almost as a thank you for giving you money. Now, interest basically makes you have more money. That's good. Generally speaking, banks pay what we call compound interest, but we're going to pause for that for just a moment until we get to the financial section. We're going to actually just deal with something called simple interest. And what that basically means is we're going to put some money in the bank and assume they give me the same amount of interest every month. So if I put, I don't know, $1,000 into the bank and the bank pays me $20 interest per month, what it means is every single month my bank account will go up by $20. That is simple interest. Now, getting money from the bank, there are in fact two ways of getting money from the bank, and that is to steal it, don't do that, not a good idea, or to ask for it nicely. Now, when you say ask for it nicely, you go in there, fill in a lot of paperwork, and hopefully if you're earning money, they'll actually give you a loan. And generally speaking, most banks give us loans to buy things like cars, houses, boats. I don't have a boat, I don't want a boat, but I've certainly got a house and it's costing me a fortune. Now, what like when happens when we give the bank our money, they pay us interest. The same is also true. When I go to the bank and they give me money, then they say, well, yeah, you can have my money, but you're going to have to pay me the interest or for the you're going to have to pay me for allowing you to have some money, which seems a bit weird. And interesting, the bank always asks you for more money back than they ever give you in interest. That's how they make money. But 
Some of the language you need to know, and particularly in financial maths, are, is coming up here. So principal. Now I am not talking about principal Skinner from The Simpsons. I've never watched an episode of The Simpsons in my life, really. Don't judge. Um, we are talking about the technical term that banks use and this course use to talk about the money that you borrow from the bank or that you give the bank. All right? It can actually stand for both of those. Now, using that, we can look at what we call our occurrence relationship in a different way. Whereas before we had that V0 was equal to our start term, because we're now dealing with money, we actually change the language. And we say that V0 now is going to be equal to the principal. So whenever you see the word principal in a question, you are always going to be dealing with money. Do you notice that the formula doesn't change or the basic formula doesn't change? It still stays as to get my next term, I take my current term and add this value of D. Now, because we're dealing with money and because the bank's payers interest that's very specifically worked out, that value of D actually is equal to R divided by 100 times V0. Now, we've already seen that V0 is our principal. So what it says is we're taking our principal, we're multiplying it by something called R divided by 100 and adding it onto my original amount or my last number, and that will give me the next number. Okay, now this R basically is called the rate of interest. And if you know anything about money or banks or whatever else, you'll know that they give you interest based in a percentage term. So how does this work in real life? Well, lovely. Thank you very much. Cambridge have uh, allowed me to use their work examples from the Cambridge Further Math textbook. And I am deeply, deeply grateful. This is a question directly from that textbook. Example one says, Cheryl invests $5,000. Thanks, Cheryl. God, you're rich in an investment account. Investment, just I'm giving them money. I'm investing in them, which pays 4.8%. Now, that's my interest rate. So I now know that R is 4.8% per annum. Well, no, per annum. Another confusingly bizarre term, per annum just means per year. Thank you very much. No big deal. So she's getting 4.8% interest per year, and it says simple interest. Now, Later on in the course, we deal with compound interest. So it's important in each of your questions to look for whether it's simple interest or compound interest. Model this simple investment using a recurrence relationship of the form V0 equals the principal, Vn plus 1 equals that plus D. So basically what they're saying is, take the formula V0 equals principal, and Vn plus 1 equals Vn plus D, where D is equal to R on 100 times V0. And they're actually just saying, turn it into a real formula with some actual numbers in it. So first things first, what was the principal amount paid into my bank account? $5,000. So there we go. V0 is $5,000. We're going to do a comma. That is supposed to be a comma. Actually, that is a shonky comma. Come on, people. There we go. We know that we get V of M plus one. That stays in every formula. So does the V of M. But we now know because this uh, formula above tells us that we can work out what the value of D is. And it even gives us a hint in the question. It says, take the value of D equal to R time, uh, divided by 100 times V0. Okay, so bringing out my CAS calculator. What do we see? I'm going to put it into main mode. Thank you very much, CAS calculator. Now it says, to find the value of D, take R, which you know is 4.8, divide it by 100. Thank you very much. And now times that by V0. What earth is V0? Oh, we've got that 5,000, 5, 1, 2, 3, and press enter. And there we go. We now know the value of D is 240. So I'm now going to add 240. And believe it or not, that is my final answer. They just wanted you to work out the value of D and put in the value of the principal into that equation and come up with your own recurrence relationship. Pwah. Who said maths is hard? Okay, Cheryl, simple interest investment is modeled by this, V0 equals 5,000. What does that mean? Well, once again, Cheryl has got $5,000 somewhere. This is her investment. And it says that V of N plus one is V of N plus 240. To get to my next term, take the previous term and add 240. Right, use the model to determine the value of Cheryl's investment after three years. Okie dokie, we can do that. So we're starting with V0 as $5,000. So at the end of the first year, how do we do that? Well, we take 5,000 and we're going to add on $240. Okay, so that's $5,240. V2 is going to be 5,000 
$240. Because at the start of the new year, it's what she had in there at the end of the last year, add another $240. Wow, this stuff isn't difficult. $5,480. And at the end of the third year, we're going to take $5,000. $480, adding on another $240. Can I do that in my head? No, let's try this on my calculator. 5480 plus 240 gives me the staggering 5720. 5720. If you're actually sitting there going, how could you not that add, add on? Don't judge. It's not fair. Okay? I'm trying to think about how to do this properly. So there we go. When will Cheryl's investment first exceed $6,000 and what will its value be? Well, actually, I'm going to use my CAS for that. Because what I'm going to get, I'm going to put in my 5,000 and I'm going to say, well, can I have that plus 240? And this is going to do all the hard work for me. So let's just check. There's the end of the first year, second year, third year. Yep, that's good. Fourth, fifth. Okay, so there we go. So when will it first exceed $6,000 in its fifth year? Okay, so at the end of its fifth year, it will exceed that $6,000 and it will be $6,200. Whoa, thank you calculator for doing the hard work for me. Sadly, not everything goes up in value. You go onto a forecourt, you buy a car and you drive it off that forecourt, and the second it touches that road, it loses $1,000. You can literally drive it off, put it back on and go, do you know what, I've changed my mind, I don't want it. And they'll go, yeah, certainly, you've just lost $1,000. You paid me $30,000 for that, I'll give you $29,000 back. For driving it off the forecourt, nuts. Now that loss of $1,000 is called a depreciation. Yeah, when something loses value, it depreciates. Pretty much everything you buy depreciates, strangely except house prices. Weirdly, that keeps going up, which is good. But you buy, I don't know, a television or a computer or a PlayStation or anything, a car, and as time goes on, it's worth less and less and less. And that's actually depreciation. Now, obviously, this is the reverse of interest. Whereas interest adds on the price, depreciation takes away from the price. And there's two types of depreciation. First one is called flat rate depreciation. Now, what does it mean by a flat rate depreciation? Well, when something's a flat rate, it means that every single year, the same amount of money is taken off, regardless of its use. Doesn't matter how much I use it, a certain amount of money is subtracted year after year after year. And you know what? This formula is getting a little bit boring now. It seems to be the same formula all the time. If I'm adding on, if I'm sort of getting money like interest, I'm gonna add on D, but now for depreciation, what do you notice? I'm taking away D. Because we are dealing with money again, or because we are generally dealing with money, V0 is our initial value. It can also be called the principal. Again, do you see what they're doing? They're trying to trick us with stupid language. But the good news is the value of D is once again R on 100 times V0. That again means that something is going to depreciate by some sort of interest, if that's money or it might be a fixed cost. So the great thing is that's just one formula to rule them all. But oh, another example from Cambridge. Wow, your examples are good. Here's example three. A new car, oh, funny, we were just talking about cars, was purchased for $24,000. So I now know that V0 is $24,000. The car depreciates by 20% of its purchase price each year. The minute I see a percentage, I know that that's my R value. My R is now 20 uh, model the depreciating value. Now, here we go. There's the trick in the question that tells me whether I'm going to be adding on this value or taking away. Interest, add on, depreciation, take away, using a recurrent relationship of that form. So once again, it's saying, write it out as V0. We know our initial value was 24,000. We know that every recurrence formula starts with Vn. Uh, sorry, Vn plus 1 is equal to Vn. Now, what I'm going to do is take away this value of D. And we know that D is calculated by the rate divided by 100 times my initial value, my V0, which is 24,000. Well, let's see whether we can fire up my calculator and see what that is. So 20 divided by 100 is equal to times 24,000 gives me the great value of 4,800. So I'm going to take away 4,800 and lo and behold, whoop, whoop, there is my recurrence relationship. Don't forget the comma. Example four then goes on to actually use this, believe it or not. And it says the flat rate depreciation of a car is modeled by what we've just worked out. Use the model to determine the value of the car 
after two years. All right, so it starts at $24,000, that's V0. So at the end of the first year, it's going to be 24,000 minus 4,800. So 24,000 minus 4,800 gives me the sparkling value of $19,200. So $19,200. And what do I now need to do? Well, my V2, my end of my second year is going to take $19,200 minus 4,800. Maybe we should have written that one bit better, Maths Guru. 24,000 minus 4,800 gives me 19,200. That makes more sense for when you print these off. And once again, firing up my calculator, what do I get? Let's now take away, uh, oops, let's take away, thank you very much, another 4,800 gives me 14,400. So $14,400, $14,400, don't forget the dollars, otherwise you'll lose marks in an exam. And there we go. Part B, if the car was purchased in 2014, in what year will the car's value depreciate to zero? So this was 2014. Let's go back to my calculator. And what I'm gonna do is say, right, 24000 equals. Thank you very much. Now, I'm gonna take my answer and I'm gonna subtract from it, what did we say, 4,800. So 2014 was when it purchased. That's how much it's worth in 2015, 16. 17, 18, and there we go, 2019. So, in what year will the car's value depreciate to zero? And that's an interesting question, 2018 or 2019? Let's just check that again, all right? So at the start of 2014, it was worth $24,000. Then that was 2015. 2016, that's how much it started worth. So the interesting question is, in the 2018, at the end of 2018, I will in fact have paid off my car. So in what year will the car's value depreciate to zero? I think it's 2000 and, oops, I don't know what's just happened there. My apologies for that. I think it's 2018. Let's just check one more time. Better safe than sorry. So 24, one, two, three, minus, oh, enter. So minus, <laughs> My, my fingers aren't working today, 4,800, oh, come on, 4,800. So that was at the start of 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019. So actually it's 2019, whoa, all very exciting. So at the end of two, oh, sorry guys, I don't know what's going on with this screen. So 2019. Unit cost depreciation is the last one. Now, unit cost depreciation, basically, uh, like photocopiers, actually depreciate using unit cost depreciation. How come? Well, because they actually uh, lose money with every photocopy. So every time you do a photocopy, the people who own the photocopy go, no, 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 it's worth less. So a photocopy that does like 10 million photocopies will be worth a lot, lot less than a photocopy that does a million copies the general idea. But interestingly, the unit cost for depreciation is exactly the same formula. This time though, D does not get calculated using R on 100 times V0. That is not important for unit cost depreciation. Because in the questions, they'll actually tell you the unit cost of the depreciation. And you want to look for those words. A professional gardener purchased a lawnmower for $270. The mower depreciates in value by $3.50 each time it is used. Model the depreciation value of the mower using a recurrence relationship of this form. So V0 is equal to 270. And so we do a comma. We know that Vn plus 1 is equal to Vm. And I'm going to take away my D, my value of D which is my depreciation per use. And in the question, they told me that actually it was $3.50 per use. And there we go, ladies and gentlemen, VN plus one equals VN minus 3.5. What about this one? Oh, that's a surprise. Question six builds on from example five, or example six builds on from example five. The depreciated value of the lawnmower is modeled by that. Okay, so V0 is 270 and VN plus one is equal to VN minus 3.5. Use the model to determine the value of the mower after it has been used three times. Okay, so we started off at $270. 
V1, V2 and V3 are the values we're looking for. So we're looking for 270 minus 3.5. Mm -hmm. 270 minus 3.5. So let's actually just do this using my calculator. There's 270. Can you minus 3.5.1, 2 and 3 times? Yep, and then we can write those in as $266.50, $263, and finally, $259.50, which will be the value of my mower after three times. How many times can the mower be used before its depreciated value is less than $250? So that was part A, this is part B. Okay, so let's bring up my calculator and we'll start from the very beginning because it's a very good place to start. So $270 minus 3.5, so there's one use, two uses, three uses, four uses, five uses, and six uses. So there we go, so six uses will bring it less than $250, so six uses is my correct answer. Ladies and gentlemen, there we go. That seems like a lot, and I'm really sure this was 30 minutes long. Quite a big chapter, but we've dealt with flat rate, flat rate depreciation, unit cost depreciation, simple interest. We've dealt with um, oh, modeling linear growth and decay. There's been a lot. Thank you so much for watching. If you could do me the honor, please, of subscribing by clicking that little doohickey over there, I'd greatly appreciate it. And let your friends know would also be great as well. Video loading below uh, from the Further Mass series. Um, but I'm Mass Guru, signing off. I look forward to seeing you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.